Professor Harpans Mukhya, it is a true pleasure to have you here and learn from you. Your work has informed us and inspired us. One particular instance that comes to mind is uh, the controversy around the movie Padmavati. Your article on the historical facts about it helped us make a video drama on the subject. Both the English and the Hindi versions are on our channel. Thank you once again, Professor Mukhya. And um, now I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about Professor Mukhya, even though most of you already know about him, but uh, I would still like to add uh, a few things uh, that you, know, you may or may not know. Uh, Professor Harvans Mukhya is one of India's best known historians. His career is too long and illustrious for me to go into details here, but I will give a few highlights. After completing his doctorate at Delhi University, Professor Mukhya went on to serve as professor of medieval history at Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU, Delhi. He was rector of JNU from 1999 to 2002 and retired in 2004. Some of his books include The Mughals of India, Historians and Historiography during the reign of Akbar. And along with his co-authors, Praful Bidwai and Achin Vinayak, Religion, Religiosity and Communalism. As an aside, you can find an interview we did, Peace Vigil did, with Achin Vinayak on the rise of communalism on our YouTube channel. Among Professor Harbans Mukhya's many academic papers, I would call attention to communalism and the writing of medieval Indian history, a reappraisal, celebration of failure as dissent in Urdu Ghazal, and the political abuse of history, Babri Masjid Ram Janmabhumi dispute. Please join me in welcoming Professor Harbans Mukhya. Sir, it is a great pleasure to have you as a speaker in today's program entitled Understanding Communalism, its past and present. And I also thank each and every participant who is joining us either on Zoom or on Facebook. Over to you, Professor Mukhya, and I'm really looking forward to learning from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peace Vigil, uh, and thank you very much, both Shirin and uh, uh, Samir, for inviting me. Uh, I've been watching these programs uh, with with uh, with great avid interest, uh, and uh, often benefiting from the discussion. So it's a great pleasure for me, privilege for me, to be one of the participants, one of the panelists for for your discussion. I uh, the 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 theme announces communalism its past and present. Let me say uh, at the outset that I, I'm not going to discuss the history of communalism in India, but uh, more like how it was viewed uh, at one time in the past, in the medieval past, particularly because that has often become the reference point for the. Uh, rise of communism, if you like, and how it is viewed and practiced in, in the present time. So that's my uh, focus, rather than tracing the history of communalism. Uh, <clears throat> communalism, of course, is has a specific Indian meaning, but in a way one can see that uh, it's a phenomenon uh, rising, has risen earlier and rising again, raising its head again, uh, in, in, a, in a great deal of the world, great part of the world. So uh, I'll be discussing it's the, 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 the phenomenon of communalism mostly in the Indian context, but it's not merely uh, specifically uh, merely an Indian uh, phenomenon. It's a much wider phenomenon in, a, in different aspects. It takes on different facets, but it is a phenomenon that one can watch around the world, in different parts of the world, in different parts, even of the most advanced world so far, so far, so, I'm sorry, so-called. Well, uh, to begin with, uh, let us say that, uh, uh, to, to let, let me start with a, with a, with a uh, obiter dictum. Uh, 
that communalism is actually not a historical phenomenon, but essentially a political phenomenon. I'll try to explain a, a little bit later why it is, but uh, that's my, my uh, emphasis that we should look upon it as a political phenomenon rather than as a legacy of history. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, we are all born, each one of us is born into several identities. Uh, one is born into a gender identity, male or female. One is born into caste identity in India. One is born into the identity of the color of skin, whether one belongs to, uh, whether, whether one is an urban dweller or rural dweller, uh, whether one is uh, rich or poor, belongs to a rich or poor family, whatever. So there are several identities we are born into. And most of these identities we carry with us throughout our life. Some of these identities can be changed uh, and some of these can't be changed. You can change your uh, religion if you like, though it's not very, very often that this happens, but it can be done. Theoretically, it can be done. It's also done once in a while, but you can't change the color of your skin, whatever the amount of uh, fair, <laughs> fair, what's called uh, fair and lovely uh, uh, cream one uses. Uh, yeah, so that, right. uh, you know, we have, we have several identities. Each one of us has several identities, you know. Uh, now, these are our existential identities. These take us to uh, what I would like to call the existential community identity that the identity of gender, the identity of color of my skin, the identity of many things. These are all, I, so one belongs to one community, namely male community. One belongs to, also belongs to the community of the color of skin. If I go to Africa, if I go to US or uh, Europe, the color of my skin, is distinct from the color of skin of the most of the people in Africa or Europe or America. So that's, that, that takes me to uh, another community uh, of, of South Asians or whatever, people with brown color of skin or whatever. So that uh, all, most of these are community identities. Uh, these are existential community identities which uh, I'm emphasizing the term community identity because as a gender, as a male, as a person with brown skin, as a whatever uh, other identity, even caste, I don't know what my caste is, but nonetheless, if you, if you know what your caste is, then your caste identity or whatever. So that we belong to a certain community of the same religion, same caste, same, uh, gender, etc., etc. We, we to, or, or rather, we belong, belong to several communities. Each one of us belongs to several communities. You know. Now, what this uh, community identity does, whichever one it is, religion, caste, uh, color of skin, uh, your resources, whichever one, what it does, it it differentiates. It establishes difference between one and another. It, as, as, a, as a male establishes difference uh, between male and men and women. As a, uh, as a religious identity, as a identity of the family uh, or the religion of the family I was born into, one is born into, it uh, demarcates or differentiates or establishes the difference between uh, a, a Christian and a Hindu and a Muslim and a Sikh or whatever other religion. So that it makes a, it, it establishes a difference between one community and the other community, you know. Now, uh, difference is a question of, is, 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 as I said, an existential phenomenon. It exists uh, uh, for all of us. It, it, it comes to us with the very birth, uh, that we, that we, as soon as we are born, it comes to us and it stays with us. But the difference does not amount to hostility. Uh, that's crucial. Difference 
is one phenomenon and we all are different from one another. The whole humanity is different in, in, in many different, not only color of skin and, and gender and so on and so forth, but in our appearance, in our, the voice that we are given to, uh, the voice with which we speak, the, and so many other things. So the differences exist in each one of us, between each one of us and the rest of humanity, all kinds of differences. And they also demarcate the individual from the rest of humanity. They also demarcate communities of various kinds from other communities and so on and so forth. So difference is, a, is an exist, existential reality. But, you know, the the, so, uh, so we all have various community identities, individual identities, as well as community identities. And that uh, establishes the difference. However, it is when difference is mobilized into a communal identity, that is where the problem arises. Uh, that difference is mobilized through <coughs> The difference uh, is mobilized into uh, a certain uh, objective for achieving a certain objective. The objective can be very small, uh, very sort of everyday kind of objective. Uh, somebody, someone comes to me and says, uh, you are a Hindu, so I'm holding uh, a puja in my house, so come and join us. That would be one kind of uh, mobilization of my Hindu identity since I'm born into a Hindu family. Or somebody comes and says, we are holding a namaz or a Quran Khani, uh, reading the Quran or reading the Guru Granth Sahib, come and join us for that. So a very small everyday kind of affair. You know. Difference can be mobilized into, uh, I'm building a temple here, please contribute, or a mosque here, please contribute to it. Uh, that's a slightly bigger kind of mobilization than holding a puja or namaz. But nonetheless, it's a mobilization of that identity of ours, of each one of us for a certain objective. And the difference is mobilized at its highest level as a political phenomenon. That if you are a Hindu, you must vote for BJP. If you are a Muslim, you must vote, vote for uh, OSC's MIM. Or if you are a Sikh, you must for Akali Dal, vote for Akali Dal. So that the difference, the difference of community identity of which I have been talking uh, at length, the difference of community identity is now being mobilized into a communal identity. Uh, uh, it sort of, you know, foregrounds this kind of mobilization of community identity into a communal identity. A, it foregrounds one of the many identities into which we are born uh, and with which we live. Uh, one of the many identities. Uh, when, I'm, when somebody comes and says, if you are a Hindu, you must vote for BJP. It's the Hindu identity, not my male identity, not my any other identity, but my Hindu identity, which is being foregrounded in this. That's one uh, thing that happens. And the second thing that happens is that it's the, it establishes this mobilization, establishes extraneous control over my identity. That I'm born into a Hindu family or a Muslim family or whatever, whichever family, that, that's part of my being. But when somebody comes and says, if you are a Hindu, since you are a Hindu, you must vote for BJP or you must vote for, vote for uh, Ram Temple in Ayodhya and demolition of Babri Masjid and Ram Temple in Ayodhya. My identity as a Hindu is now being forfeited to the mobilizer of my identity. That mobilizer decides what my what I should do with my identity. Uh, uh, that I must do that. I must vote for BJP, or, must, I, or, or I must do this uh, 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 because I am a Hindu or a Muslim or, or or Sikh or whatever. So that two things happen, as I as I said, 
one, only one of my identities is getting foregrounded. And second, that this identity is being forfeited to an extraneous control. Somebody else controls my identity as a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh or whatever, whatever, you know. Now, this amounts to uh, the surrender of my identity to this somebody else who is commanding me to do what, what, whatever I'm supposed to do because I'm born into a certain identity, certain religious identity. Uh, and I carry it with me, carry it with my name. My name tells everyone, any, anybody's name tells them, you don't have to announce you are a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian. Your name tells everyone whether you are a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or whichever religion. So that, uh, so that you know, uh, the very fact that you carry a name and therefore you belong to a certain religious or, or, or are, are born into a certain religion. You might be a total atheist. Uh, you might declare yourself to be a total atheist. And yet uh, your name will indicate that you belong to a certain uh, identity of a religious identity. So that uh, this identity is being forfeited uh, to somebody else, somebody else's control. Now, let me also say that, <coughs> excuse me, that there is that this uh, this transformation of or mobilization of community identity into communal identity is not a an inevitable phenomenon. That it 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 is not it's not. Uh, inevitable that uh, that I must sort of, uh, since I must, uh, I am a Hindu or I am a Muslim or I am a Sikh or whatever, uh, I, I, I must do whatever I'm being told to do. In fact, uh, uh, after every <clears throat> communal riot, after every communal riot, uh, this is the history of, of communal riots, uh, invariably, you will find cases of people, very devout Hindus and devout Muslims and devout Sikhs and so on and, and so on, devout people uh, doing their puja or ibadat or namaz every day, very regularly, uh, practicing Hindus and practicing Muslims and practicing others. They, after a riot, they come and uh, offer uh, succor and support to people of other, uh, the other community, which has been the victim of violence in the communal riot. This are uh, in in invariably you have examples of this coming after almost every communal riot. So that these devout Hindus and devout Muslims, <coughs> who offer their uh, the puja and namaz every day, they are devout, they are devout in their community identity, but they do not allow their community identity to be transformed into communal identity. So there is nothing inevitable about the community identity being mobilized. The, mobilize, the mobilization effort takes place, certainly the mobilizer comes to you and seeks to mobilize your community identity into communal identity, but it's our, it depends on us whether we allow that to happen or do not allow that to happen. You know? So that community identity is in a way, in a way related to communal identity. You, 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 you mobilize a community identity and transform it into a communal identity uh, because you are, belong to that particular community. You know? Uh, so it is related to that, it's in a way the basis of that, and yet it's not the equivalent of that, and there is no inevitability that it would become the equivalent of that, uh, that it must be, it must be transformed, it will be transformed into, uh, into communal identity. There is no, there is no inevitability, it's a question of uh, one's choice, one's own decision. Uh, in India, the question of communalism leads us basically to Hindu-Muslim question. Uh, it can be other forms of communalism. We have had uh, riots against the Sikhs uh, in 1984. Uh, uh, we have also uh, often uh, killing of Christians because they are Christians. Uh, 
these uh, these 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 also occur once in a while uh, not once in a while in fact far too frequently but they occur but primarily when one talks of communalism one talks of hindu and muslim the problem of hindu muslim ident identities and their relationship the communal relationship that's what uh, uh, now this really uh, the uh, the uh, i'm i'm talking of it as a relationship hindu and muslim relationship but essentially uh, communalism brings in the question of hostility hindu hostility uh, assumed hostility between hindus and muslims and therefore uh, tension and therefore violence and therefore uh, voting and so on and so forth you know so at the base of this communal as assumption of communalism or the premise of communalism is hostility between communities primarily between hindus and muslim community was this hostility present throughout uh, was it an ever present hostility through history now usually <coughs> excuse me usually this uh, history this uh, Uh, hostility is traced to medieval india medieval indian history you know uh, medieval india itself is a very uh, questionable uh, category of analysis but i'm not going to that uh, medieval india uh, used to begin even now it primarily be primarily begins uh, it used to begin with the medieval indian history that is it used to begin <clears throat> at a time when history was studied in terms of uh, political dynast dynasties ruling dynasties political battles and wars and empires and administration and so on, uh, conquests and so on uh, mainly history of kings and queens and their wars and battles and so on and mainly uh, uh james mill particularly had taught us in 1818 1817 18 to look at history in terms of the religious identity of the ruling dynasty hindu period muslim period british period we are familiar with that he had divided the indian history into these three periods so what is most important in uh, ancient or medieval india or what he what he calls hindu and british i'm sorry hindu and muslim periods is the ruling dynasty's religion because religion he assumed was the basis of the functioning of the state it is a british who brought in he was a utilitarian he was against all religions he uh, he had contempt for all religions he had contempt for islam he had even more contempt for hinduism uh, and it uses very abusive words for them but because he was a utilitarian he thought modern science modern uh, modern science and technology and modern ideas should really be the governing principles of states and the british have brought this to india so we we should be grateful to the british for having taken us out of this morass of uh, religious domination of our state and society and so on so that uh, we uh, when we studied history in terms of uh, uh, religious identities of the ruling dynasties then history of ancient india what we later on came to be called came to call ancient and medieval india instead of hindu and muslim india uh, the history of ancient india uh, began with uh, prior to after, after prior to 1920s it began with aryans uh, Uh, and uh, after the discovery of harappa civilization mohenjodaro and harappa and so on in the valley it was then called in the valley civilization it came to be predated predated by another uh, 1500 or odd years so that it began uh, from the 1920s or 30s onwards from harappa period down to about harsha uh, about 7 7 and 7 uh, uh, 7th century mid 7th century 8th century about that and then there was a vacant period then the next period of medieval india or muslim india began with mahmud of ghazni either mahmud of ghazni's invasion or with the establishment of delhi sultanate about 1200 ad around 1200 ad and went on to 1707 
when Aurangzeb died. Then the modern period, British period or modern period began with 1765. Again, there was a gap of about 50, 60 years, uh, where, 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 which was, as it were, no man's land. And then uh, the modern period began. So history was seen in terms of the religious identities of the ruler, uh, <coughs> not of modern India, but of ancient and medieval India. Now, it brings to us, brings us the question of coming of Islam to India, when medieval India began. What did the coming of Islam to India mean? A, uh, Islam came to India through three gates. One was the battlefield, of course, uh, which was a major uh, gateway to, to the coming of Islam open to the coming of Islam. Another was the Sufi Khanqas, and third was trade, particularly in South India and Kerala. Uh, trade was, tra Kerala, Arabs had trade relations with Kerala long before Islam was, was uh, established, Islam came along. Uh, so uh, these three doors were open to the coming of Islam, but very largely it was the battlefield which brought to Islam. Although uh, Islam had preceded in a way, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, the battlefield in terms of uh, Khanka. The Sufis had uh, brought Islam to India even before the, uh, the, the rulers. But nonetheless, uh, the battlefield was a primary source of the coming of Islam to India. Now, uh, the... Uh, Islam, then uh, the Muslim who won the battles, uh, we, use, we have stopped calling this Muslim rule long ago. We stopped calling it Hindu and Muslim rule, etc. And Hindu period and Muslim period. So, and we have even stopped calling these rulers as Muslim rulers per se, but, uh, but uh, they were Muslim nonetheless, you know. And uh, so the coming of Islam uh, at the level of the state, did many things. Uh, at the level of society also did many things, but let me talk about the state first. A, uh, the, uh, the Turks and the Sultans of Delhi and the, uh, and the Mughals who came, they did uh, give a very prominent space to Islam in their governance. Uh, Islam was the idiom through which <coughs> governance took place, you know. The armies of Islam, the Khalifa, uh, the ruler was called Khalifa, that's the Mughal ruler was called, called Khalifa. Prior to the Mughal ruler, the Sultans of Delhi were called uh, uh, Amir, uh, Nasir Amir of Mominin, the helper of the Amir of Mo Mo Muslims, that is to say, uh, the Khalifa, helper of the Khalifa not Khalifa himself. Later on, he came to be called Khalifa himself. So that the, the, and the, and the uh, language of uh, Sharia, the Jizya and, uh, and uh, also Zakat, Jizya and Kharaj and so on and so forth, the language of Sharia was used uh, for uh, governance. So Islam was a very strong presence in the governance of medieval Indian state. Let me say here before I go on further that Islam didn't mean the same thing to everyone, every ruler. It meant different things to different rulers. You know? so, so Islam, uh, when we say Islam had uh, a strong presence, uh, I also like to emphasize that Islam would mean uh, it's not a uniform kind of subservience to Islam that we are witnessing among the rulers of uh, medieval India, you know. Uh, in fact, uh, a ru ruler like uh, Alauddin Khilji, the much maligned Alauddin Khilji, uh, he, uh, uh, there, he did two marvelous things. He once consulted his uh, <clears throat> uh, Malvi uh, about asking him what, whether he, what he was doing was in accordance with, I'm doing this, is it in accordance with the Sharia or no? So the Malvi said, no, sir, it's not. Qazi Mughisuddin was his name, uh, his, his Qazi. 
Uh, then he said, okay, am I, I'm doing this. Is it in accordance with the Sharia or no? The Qazi said, no, sir. Uh, and he kept on saying, no, whatever you're doing is not in accordance with the Sharia. Then uh, angry, he didn't kill him. <laughs> it was nice of him not to have killed the Qazi as a punishment. But uh, he was angry and he said, in the end, he said, okay, I do what I think is, 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 is in the interest of the state. I don't care whether it is in accordance with the Sharia or not. That's one, uh, one kind of adherence to religion that we witness in Arauddin Khalji. And the other was that uh, he, uh, he had conquered a lot of territory and established his state and so on and so forth. And there was peace and so on. Then he thought, uh, Prophet Muhammad had established a new religion and become immortal because he had four companions with him, very uh, honest and faithful companions with him. And he became immortal through the establishment of a new religion that is Islam. So let me also, I also have four companions. He enumerated those companions who were also very faithful to him uh, and honest. So let me also found a new religion and become immortal like uh, Prophet Muhammad was. Uh, but then <laughs> he was advised, he was advised, you know, establishing religions is not a question of how many, how many honest companions you have. It's a question of, you know, God uh, inspiring you to or revealing his truth or inspiring you to or, or uh, whatever. God coming to your head to establish religions. It's not, it doesn't get established uh, because you have companions. So he desisted from the idea. But, you know, it shows the attitude, his attitude towards Islam, you know, but he was quite willing to become a rival to Muhammad by seeking to establish a new religion. And others, uh, others like, uh, uh, others like, sorry, uh, uh, Others like uh, uh, Akbar and so on, uh, they, I don't want to go into uh, all of these one by one. There's too much of this, too much of too many details. But I'm just saying that uh, the, uh, the, for example, Akbar's attitude towards Islam was not the same as Aurangzeb's was, you know, and so many. So each one had a different kind of attitude towards Islam. So when we say that, uh, uh, so when we say that uh, uh, Islam had a presence in the, quite a strong presence in the uh, governance of the medieval Indian state, uh, let, I'm also emphasizing that Islam didn't mean the same thing from the beginning to the end. In fact, even in the same reign of a same king, it didn't mean the same thing from the beginning to the end, including in Aurangzeb's reign. But that's one part of it. That having said that Islam had a strong presence, let me move on to the next question. Can we then say that the medieval Indian state was a theocratic state? That becomes an interesting question, larger and interesting question. Uh, it's uh, how do we know when the state is, when, when can we call a state an, a, a theocratic state? Uh, we call a state a theocratic state. Let me set out two conditions when we call a state a theocratic state. One, in that state, uh, only the religion of the state, religion of the king, ruler, uh, prevails or religion, religion of the state, which becomes a religion of the state. Uh, that is the only religion which, which, which prevails. No other religion can prevail in that state, within the territory of that state, like Saudi Arabia, for example. And the second is that the uh, jurisdiction, the legal juris, ju, jurisprudence, jurisprudence of uh, or jurisdiction of law or jurisprudence that prevails can only be the jurisprudence of that religious, of that religion. Like in Islam, it will be Sharia. Uh, Sharia is the only uh, jurisprudence which can, or legal system which can prevail. And no other legal system can prevail. Now, it's then that we can uh, we can assert that 
a state is a theocratic state when it has these, it meets with these two conditions. Did medieval India state, medieval Indian state meet with these two conditions? Uh, it's very interesting to uh, realize that uh, when uh, India was divided in 1947, in 1941, the last census was held under the British regime, uh, where the Muslim population in India was 24.7 or let's say 25% of the total. Uh, one quarter of the population, India's population was Muslim population in the subcontinent, undivided India. Now, 75% uh, uh, of the population was still non-Muslim in, and as we, this is in 1941. And very interestingly, uh, another, very interesting data is that uh, in 1830s, uh, Bishop Heber had come to India. Uh, we don't have <coughs> population data before that, but roughly we have some indication that Bishop Bishop Heber states that Bishop Heber states that uh, one in every six in India uh, of Indian population is a Muslim. That's to say about 16% of the population, 16, slightly over 16% of the population is Muslim in India in 1830s. And in 1941, the Muslim population had risen to 25%. One in every four had become Muslim. There is, in other words, a 25, I'm sorry, 50% rise from 16% to 24, 25% of the population, 50% rise in Muslim population during the British regime, when the British were ruling here, not when the Muslim were ruling here. So that uh, as we go back in time, the population in the Muslim population would be smaller and smaller as, as, as logic suggests, you know, it can't be, it couldn't have been 50% uh, at one time and having been reduced to 25, 16 or 25% later on. It, can, it could only have been smaller and smaller. So that in medieval India itself, the, the population, uh, uh, the, 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 the population of the Muslim state, so-called Muslim state, was a very, a very small segment of the population was, had accepted Islam. Uh, very small segment. In other words, it was not a state where only one religion prevailed, namely this religion of Islam, uh, that it was a state where many, many religions prevailed. Predominantly, the Hindu religion prevailed. That's one aspect. The other aspect of it is that if you look at the uh, demographic, demographic distribution of Muslim population in India, in the subcontinent, in, the, in undivided India, including Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, prior to 47, if you look at the distribution of Muslim population, then you will sign, find that, uh, try to imagine the map of undivided India. Uh, you'll find that the heavy concentration, overwhelming concentration of overwhelming density of Muslim population in the, in the, in the, in, in the subcontinent, in the subcontinent is uh, in four uh, geographical corners of India. One is in the West, which is now Pakistan, where the Muslim population is naturally was and is uh, predominant. The other is what is now Bangladesh in the East. The third is uh, Kashmir Valley, where Muslim population was 98%. Uh, Kashmir Valley, not the whole of Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir. And the fourth is Kerala, where a part of Kerala, not the whole of Kerala, Malabar region, uh, Malapuram, Malabar region, the Muslim population is, is not overwhelming, but it's, it's in majority. So that in the four corners, the Muslim, the distribution of Muslim population in India 
uh, is in four corners of medieval India. And these four corners are also the, the geographical corners are also the political corners of medieval Indian state, where in, in every state, uh, uh, the hold of the state, particularly in medieval times, is strongest in, its, in the heartland of its empire. And it grows weaker as it spreads out to the peripheries of the empire. You know. So that uh, 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 Pakistan, what is now Pakistan, West Punjab, where Muslims were, uh, are, were and are in a dominant position, predominant position, uh, this was a very disturbed area, particularly the west part of West Pakistan was a very disturbed area all the time, very, very disturbed area, you know, to never under the control of the Sultans and the Mughals. They were, of course, during the Sultanate period, they were constantly, constant Mongol attacks in this area, including the attack by the Mughals themselves who came from this region, uh, via this region. Uh, that was the only sort of uh, door open to, to invaders. Uh, so, so, uh, so, Pakistan. What is now Pakistan, West Punjab, was never under the complete dominance of the Muslim state for a long time. It was very sporadic. <coughs> Excuse me. What is now Bangladesh had similarly ruling uh, regional dynasties, uh, which were Muslim, but it was not a. It was not the. Uh, it's not Delhi or Agra which had un, 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 unlimited and unbounded control over it uh, uh, all the time. So that, uh, and Kashmir had turned to Islam long before uh, Mughals had reached there, long, long before had Mughals had reached there. And uh, thanks to, as the many studies of Kashmir have shown, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, Contribution. The main contribution is uh, uh, the Chishti saint called Nandrishi. He's known as Nandrishi in Kashmir. Uh, he was the so it was not the state which was converting people to Islam in Kashmir, but it was a, it was a Sufi saint Nandrishi, and uh, and it, it, Kerala was never under the Sultan or the Mughal rule anyway. So that. Uh, Interesting that and 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 in the heartland of the Mughal Empire, medieval India rather, Delhi Sultan, the Mughal Empire, medieval India, the heartland, Bihar, UP, Delhi, East Punjab, the heartland of the Mughal Empire for about 500, 500 odd years, 550 to 600 years, this was the heartland of the medieval India or Muslim state. The Muslim population was never, never exceeded about 15, 12 to 15%. So it's a very, it becomes a very queer logic then to, uh, to argue that the uh, uh, Muslim state was converting people to Islam at the point of the sword, either we'll kill you or you get converted to Islam. Uh, so if we go by that logic, that the massive population of Muslims should have been in the heartland of the in Bihar, UP, Delhi, East Punjab, rather than the peripheries of the of the uh, Delhi Sultanate and Mughal Empire, where the the state was never too strong, and its hold was quite sporadic, as I said. Uh, and it was, it was, it, and the population was so small in a way, 10 to 12 to 15 percent in the heartland of the empire, where the state could have exerted itself to convert people to Islam. Which is not to say that the state didn't do any conversions. You know. In fact, the state's conversions were usually as, as, as a kind of punishment to people, you know. Uh, though anybody who had rebelled against the state or had not followed the orders of the any non-Muslim who had rebelled against the state and had not carried out the orders of the state and or the, or the king, the king was unhappy. So he would say, uh, uh, like it was done to Himu, Himu when he was defeated, uh, he was offered uh, conversion or death. Uh, so 
so either death death is a punishment conversion is also a punishment being beaten out to him second great punishment but nonetheless a punishment he who refused some accepted some didn't accept many didn't accept but conversion was always a punishment uh, meted out to them but state did intervene in conversion not on the kind of massive scale that we were talking of but some scale uh, at, at some higher level uh, some nobles and so on so forth who rajas and so on so forth you know <laughs> excuse me i am an old man so it keeps happening uh, it keeps happening to me all the time and the second criterion i had laid down was that <clears throat> only the jurisprudence of the rule of the is of the religion of the ruler should prevail in the empire in the territories of the empire did sharia prevail uh, in the delhi sultanate and the mogal empire in medieval india it did prevail in the criminal cases where a crime was committed but it had no relevance to civil uh, life how you got married how your property was distributed your social religious customs nothing there was no interference with that the hindus didn't get married according to sharia uh, and hindus uh, didn't divide their property according to sharia and nobody asked them to do so so that when it's a crime in criminal in the in the sphere of criminality it it was shariat which prevailed uh, but in the civil life which is civil life is the predominant kind of part of our life just think of how many of us around us get involved in criminal uh, with criminal law and uh, and how many of us uh, what percentage of uh, people around us get involved in criminal with criminal law and uh, how, what percentage and not this not question of what percentage all of us have to live by civil law in one form or the other even the fact that we are pursuing our degrees in uh, colleges and universities is is, is according to civil law you know so that uh, even when we drive uh, on the road we follow a civil law so that uh, uh the in a very small segment which gets involved with criminal law sharia prevailed in the larger segment of life of uh, people in the medieval indian state and society it was the it was uh, uh, it was uh, i'm sorry in the large segment of state and society it was civil life civil law it prevailed which was not which are non sharia in criminal law it was sharia which prevailed so uh, the second criterion that i had laid down also doesn't apply to medieval india so in other words islam was a very strong presence once again let me let me ask, i'm not trying to underrate it uh, or wash it away but i'm saying that even after uh, the fact that islam had a strong presence in the language of the state in the working even in the working of the state uh, uh, not uniform but nonetheless uh, even then it was not a theocratic state as we understand it therefore uh, 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 therefore uh, as a state uh, islam was important very important but it was not the overriding uh factor o- overriding concern of the state to establish uh, islam and to establish sharia as the as a as the dominant uh, uh dominant part of your life or people's life it was not the concern of the state they were not much bothered about it now uh that's the state uh let's turn to society uh uh when is once again when islam comes to india it brings a new religion it brings a new concept of god it brings a new form of uh, worship of god ibadat namaz and in the existing uh, situation the hindu concepts is not hindu concept of god there are hundreds of thousands of gods uh, gods and goddesses in hinduism and there is not one given form of worship of god there are hundreds of thousands of worship 
form of worship of god gods and goddesses so that two alternative completely exclusive completely alternative forms of concepts of god and the concepts of uh, or forms of religion forms of worship of god come face to face with each other so there was a great deal of uh, great deal of uh, give and take from each other uh, sufis learned a great deal from uh, the nirgun saints of gorakhpur in particular gorakhpur itself came later but uh, uh, the saints of that uh, nirgun saints of that that uh, that uh, genre uh, they learned a great deal uh, uh, the uh, uh, hindus also learned a great deal from them but above all uh, let us also while we are say, while, while we are stating that they there was a great deal of give and take of ideas and ceremonies and and so on and so forth you know there was also tension naturally there was great deal of tension uh, tension between these two concepts of god and therefore concept of, and therefore tension among the followers of these two concepts of god and two forms of worship of uh, religion of, of god there was tension <clears throat> uh what happens to that tension then uh it's remarkable that medieval indian society found a wonderful absolutely breathtakingly original original solution to that to the tensions uh what was the solution they found when two concepts of god stand face with face to face with each other, with each other these gods then become rivals to each other they are portrayed as rivals to each other your allah my ishwar <clears throat> uh these are competitors to each other these are rivals to each other uh and there can't be no there can be no uh, nothing uh, common between these two one la ilaha illallah there is only one allah and there is no god and on one hand on the other hand there are thousands of gods and goddesses you know how can you really reconcile them uh, and remove the tension the tension was removed by uh, bhakti saints particularly kabir kabir visualized uh, a concept of not of god or religion but he visualized a concept of a universal spirituality universal religiosity which was where ishwar and allah were both part of it and yet they were not part of it you could do without ram and rahim and you could do with ram and rahim together but they were not rivals anymore in this the universality of religiosity he was creating a very new kind of dichotomy displacing an old dichotomy the old dichotomy was between hindu religion and muslim religion islamic religion islam hinduism and islam he was these were the dichotomous uh, identities in st- in place of these two dichotomous identities where there there were two rival gods he created one universal god or one universal religiosity uh, where which were where gods ram and rahim were no longer competitors to each other you they were they were either one and the same ishwar allah tero naam gandhi ji's favorite favorite song and we repeat that every day in our life every day all of us even now repeat that so that it was this one kind of notion of you um, one universal god instead of two rival gods one universal god uh which uh, we, and one universal religiosity distanced itself from two religious identities or two religions or two organized religions really hinduism and islam with two rival concepts of god you know and it was this one religious uh, uh, religiosity universal tr- religiosity that had enormous impact on society and even the state 
this notion of one universal religiosity as a counterpoint to uh, re religions, Hindus and most de denominational religions, Hinduism, Islam, as a counterpoint to that, that was adopted even by uh, the greatest intellectual of the 16th century, court intellectual, uh, uh, namely Abul Fazl. When Abul Fazl was talking of Sulaikul, he was adopting this notion of religiosity or one universal, one universal, universal God or universality of God <clears throat> rather than the two uh, identities of God, Ishwar and Allah. This, uh, this, this notion from this notion of uh, universal God, one universal God traveled from the ground level Kabir's level right up to the top level at the imperial court of Akbar to uh, Akbar himself and to uh, to Abul Fazl, the great intellectual Abul Fazl. It's quite remarkable that we often um, assume that we are told of we are very often told that ideas, culture, and ideas percolate from top to down, top downwards. Here it is a case of the ideas, great ideas. Uh, originating at the ground level and transcending and, and going right to the top level at the imperial level. So that this was this was the counterpoint that Kabir had, Bhakti saints and Kabir had uh, created uh, counterpoint to the, uh, the tensions that the coming of Islam had brought, coming of a new concept of God. Uh, had brought to India. You know. Why do I say? How do I say uh, it? It 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 is the tensions. So how? What proof do I have uh, to say that it is the tensions? One proof I have is a, an outstanding proof that in the five hundred odd years, five hundred fifty years of uh, the so-called Muslim rule in India, when there were a lot of battles going on, wars, battles, bloodshed. Uh, going on among the rulers and the ruling classes and rival <clears throat> rival claimants to the throne and to different thrones and so on and so forth uh, uh, between the between the center and the states well not today's center and the states but you know in the central uh, imperial government and the provincial regional regional aspirants to power, etc., etc. Lots of wars, battles were going on. And that, even in the midst of that bloodshed and the political arena and battlefield, uh, social pre peace prevailed. And there is not a single communal riot. We are familiar with communal riots today, aren't we? The, about 500 or 1,000 of them occur every year under the ages of the secular state in 21st century. But uh, in medieval India, under the Muslim rule, uh, no communal riot is in record until 1714, seven years after the death of Aurangzeb. That's the first communal riot of which we have record in Ahmedabad in 1714 on the day of Holi. Uh, and it was controlled within two days uh, uh, by a Muslim administrator. So that, you know, uh, this is a great evidence of the fact that while bloodshed was occurring at the, in the political arena, at the social level, uh, uh, peace prevailed, social peace prevailed. And that's primarily, I think primarily, A, because the state was not busy converting people and enforcing Sharia, and B, because uh, the ideology of the bhakti saints, Kabir in particular, Kabir is you know when we when you mention Kabir any in any in any gathering, it immediately you know a kind of sensation occurs in you. You know Kabir has such a such a presence in our lives even now. You know he, he immediately you you it brings respect for him uh, in your respect and emotion in your hearts for him, you know. That's the kind of presence Kabir has uh, had in, for, for such a long, Kabir and Bhakti saints, other saints as well, uh, but mainly Kabir had in, in medieval India and still has today. And therefore when, um, uh, when, when, when Gandhiji spoke of 
Ishwar Allah Tehronov. He was really, uh, he was really repeating Kabir's language. His Kabir's language was, was repeated by many, many others. You know, Bulle Shah is repeating again and again Kabir's language. Even Mirza Ghalib has a great share. It's a very difficult Urdu, so it will time for me to. It will take time for me to explain, but he's virtually saying, uh, saying that, uh, you know, uh, you you become truly, truly religious only when you eradicate your community, your own uh, community, uh, communal identities, identities as a community. You know? So that uh, he's really repeating virtually uh, verbatim Kabir's language. You know? And let us forget, let us not forget that Raja Ram Mohan Rai's book, Tohfutul Mujahid, Tohfut, Tohfutul Muwahideen, it's the uh, gift for the Muwahids uh, are those who believed in believe in Tawheed. Tawheed is the kind of thing that uh, is, Tawheed is Islam also, but Tawheed here is here the Tawheed refers to the kind of one God that. Kabir has uh, envisioned. You know. So that uh, Kabir's message is what preserved social peace in medieval India. Uh, even when the the uh, the, uh, the difference remained, the difference between communities remained, Commun community identities remained. We have a great example of Eknath, the Maratha Maharashtrian saint. He has a there is a, a famous Hindu-Turk dialogue, uh, Hindu-Turk samvad. Uh, Turk is a synonym for Muslim. And one Hindu and one Muslim, one Brahman and one uh, Malvi, they argue, argue with each other. Each tells the other how wrong your, how bad your religion is, etc., etc. And they point out what is this, this kind of ceremony and that kind of, you know, uh, uh, as they call it. Uh, and yet, at the end of it, uh, they say, "No, no, we we are both talking of the same uh, same God, and we are really uh, so." Uh, there is actually uh, our religions are not our religions are quite identical, and so they end up by saying, "And yet, the fact that Hindus are Hindus and Muslims are Muslims, that Hinduism is Hinduism and Islam is Islam, that difference remains, but that difference is not allowed to turn into hostility. That's a crucial uh, point that I've been trying, I've been trying to drive at. Uh, so for such a, after such a long kind of, you know. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, now, uh, Medieval India, uh, I'll soon finish with Medieval India. Uh, medieval India, uh, oh, it's long. Medieval India uh, uh, also was, saw that, uh, that, uh, uh, what shall I say? Uh, there was no political mobilization of the masses. No medieval state had political mobilization of the masses. You know. uh, the politics functioned at its own different level and masses were sort of living at a different level. There was no involvement of the people of, 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 of society uh, in, in political processes. You know. Shivaji was one who did mobilize and established a state through the mobilization of people, but that was an exception rather than the rule. Other states also followed in the 18th century, the Mughal Empire disintegrated and various other states, regional states were established, such successor states as they are called, were established. But uh, people were, uh, people and state, they were quite autonomous of each other. This happens in the 19th and 20th century. That involvement. This, in a way, it's very, it's in a very, uh, in a way, uh, interesting, but as well as uh, significant, as well as in a way, devastating, to realize that uh, that uh, communalism really comes to us with democracy. You know, that democratic mobilization of people for political purposes, for political ends, you know, for our political objective objectives. That's when uh, communalism comes. Uh, so, 
communalism is which involves the people uh, for achieving one political end or the other, whether it is getting a vote or it is establishing a state like Pakistan or uh, establishing or trying to convert India into a into a Hindu Rashtra, uh, or for that matter earlier trying to convert into uh, establish India after independence into a secular state where people were involved, where people's consent was sought for this through democratic processes, through the mobilization of people for votes, for agitations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's when community identities, which were there earlier, which were strong community identities earlier, but not hostile to each other, they turn hostile to each other with the coming of uh, electoral poll. You, you must remember that 1920 is the first general election uh, when the first general election was held in India. Very small electorate, but nonetheless general election. And prior to that, there are various processes which were shaping up this future of India, a democratic future of India. I'm not going into that. So that it, when democracy uh, and popular vote comes to India, the communal community identities are getting transformed into communal identities, again, through mobilization. Mobilization is taking place for one, for getting to, into power, for mobilization, this caste and that caste, or that community and that, this community and that community, et cetera, et cetera, which led to the partition of India in one, uh, one case, and which is leading to uh, various kinds of tensions in the rest of India. And this is leading to the demand for one uh, one kind one state, namely the Hindu Rashtra state, based on the identity, communal identity or community identity of Hindus, majority of Hindus uh, being mobilized into communal identity. You know, so that it is this uh, this uh, uh, modern politics which has transformed. Over or which has created space for transformation of community differences into community communal hostilities, and which is now uh, occurring uh, all the time. Let me say that uh, this is not all. This has not always been the case. You know. 1947, 1950, the constitution uh, becomes operative. 1952. Uh, the first election take place in, in independent India. Uh, this, this is a very modern polity that was established in 1950. 50. Uh, very, very modern polity with universal adult franchise, which was remarkable. Uh, just think of it. Uh, imagine that uh, uh, in 1950, all men and women in India had become had become voters, had got the franchise. The French women got the right to franchise in uh, the right to vote in 1944, just four years ahead, six years ahead of India. In 19, in uh, Swiss women got the right to vote in 1973, a quarter century after India, uh, Indian women had got the right to vote. I'm talking of the most advanced countries like France and Switzerland and so on. And uh, uh, US also, uh, 1920, uh, it, uh, uh, it, uh, the ad adult franchise came to uh, USA, but it didn't go to the black men and women. You know? So that uh, even universal adult franchise, even to you in the USA came uh, in the 1930s and, and so on. So that it was a very modern polity that was established you know, with universal adult fund franchise and multi-party elections. But it was being operated by, it, uh, operative categories were, uh, operative categories were uh, primordial categories, religious identity, caste identity, regional identity, et cetera, et cetera. And as the success of these elections took place, the success of these elections reinforced these identities rather than weakening them. Nehru had thought that a modern elect, ed, 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 education system and election system will weaken these primordial identities. The contrary happened, this got strengthened. 
and therefore you see you you witness these uh, elections being uh, conducted on the basis of one kind of caste formation another ajgar and kham and uh, another now the the bjp is organizing the majority of the majority community on one single uh, uh, platform namely hindu rashtra so that uh, uh, the 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 modern polity very modern polity has given us has re-strengthened these very primordial identities given a lot of strength to this identity of community being transformed into communal identity that's the paradox of this but it hasn't always happened 19 there are several elections where these became irrelevant 1967 1971 1984 uh, these 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 issues caste and region and community became irrelevant religion became irrelevant but most of the time the elections were taking place along those lines you know so that now we have uh, we have uh, a big project uh, operating uh, reaching to its reaching its culmination namely uh, is envisioned in 1925 by the rss uh, which is uh, to establish india into a, to create india to transform into india into from a secular state to a uh, religious state uh, state of hindu rashtra now it's for us uh, as i said in the beginning it's a political project essentially a political project and it's up to us to decide whether we can allow our identities personal and community identities to be transformed into uh, from from uh, from existential identities from community identities into communal identities or we do not allow that for each one of us has to decide and for each of us has to uh, has to uh, stand up for a politics uh, and propagate and strengthen a kind of politics which uh, does not allow does not which which challenges this transformation of community identities into communal identities partly as i said because it takes control of our each one of our identity it, it, it takes control ex establishes external control but above all it establishes a control uh, over the state and society uh, which uh, which is quite alien to it so let me uh, uh, let me end by this end by saying that each one of us has to decide a to not allow our uh, identity to be transformed and b to uh, to stand up for a politics because essentially it's a po political project to stand up for a politics which does not operate with this kind of presumption with the, on this premise of transforming our com community identities into communal identities we keep our community identity as we as we list as we wish but we don't let it be transformed as an extraneous force wants us to to transform thank you very much sorry it has been very long uh, thank you very much i hope there are questions professor Habibukia, what a remarkable presentation decidedly a vast collection of important information packed there and extremely well explained i personally couldn't have asked for a better weekend boost of information so thank you so much really That's learned okay. a lot you were listening to a peace vigil lecture by professor harban smukhya on understanding communalism its past and present for question answers that followed this lecture we can refer you to another video if you see in the description of this video you will find a link to that particular video which is titled your questions answered by professor harban smukhya on communalism its past and present thank you so much for listening to our programs please don't forget to subscribe to our channel peace vigil works on peace education peace needs all of us thank you